Father in heaven, we're grateful once again because we realize better that we have a very serious choice to make. History is going to be repeated. We just simply want to make sure that we repeat the right side of history. And so, Father, may you counsel us, may you guide us, may you instruct us, Lord, as we go through these next couple of moments as we study together. And I pray that thy blessings will be upon us as we study. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're going to find that the things that we're getting ready to, to study, there, you know, one of the great struggles that I had because of the timelines uh, given for the seminars was to really go into the depth of music as I wanted to. I wanted to deal with the drum set. I wanted to deal with, you know, harmony, melody, and rhythm, and, and, and really get into the, all the intricacies of all these different things. But I knew that time would not necessarily allow considering the other principles that I have to share. So therefore, what I did was I, you know, the Lord led me to put together some very important principles that we're going to look at that can guide us when it comes to the choice of music. But in addition to that, I'm very serious when I say this, I need you to come see me at my booth. There is a gift that I brought for you all. I hope I have enough. <laughs> but nevertheless, this gift is going to help you go into some of those deeper aspects that I myself would not have been able to do in these particular seminars. I'm gonna share some simple principles on it, but you'll see, yes, my brother. The booth is gonna be in the main uh, gymnasium where the meetings were being held. The SEYC meetings are being held. It'll be immediately after sunset, once those booths open, you know, then you can come on back. And uh, it is gonna be first come, first serve basis. So, you know, and, and I just, I brought as many as I could so that way, by God's grace, it'll be a blessing to you. Now, we're going to look at some very important things with this because music is something uh, that has definitely affected us as a movement. Music is very, very powerful, and music was designed to serve a holy purpose when God made it. But what happened is, like anything else that God has made, of course, Satan gets his hand into it, and things get perverted. So we understand that. So there's a, there's, a, there's a very important principle that I wanted us to look at. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2 again. And this was something, because I was really pleading with God and saying, Lord, what, what's a way to get some very important points across to your people? And this is one area that God has brought to my attention. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you're going to find that we're going to repeat and expand, repeat and expand. But I want you to look at this. 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, you remember that we read a very important text of Scripture. It said in 1 Peter 2, 9, it said, But ye are a chosen generation. And then what else were we referred to as? A royal priesthood. Now, this is the only time that God is actually talking about his people in the general sense functioning as priests. The priesthood came to an end at that wonderful cross experience. And when Christ ascended into the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, that's when he was inaugurated as high priest in the sanctuary. And the signal of that was when the Holy Spirit poured down through the early rain. And at GYC, we're going to really talk about this, the Holy Spirit in the sanctuary. I can't wait for it. And you'll find that Jesus is that high priest. That's why in Hebrews 4, when it talks about we have not been touched with the feeling, there's not one who has been touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And it talks about Jesus being that high priest for us. So Jesus is our high priest. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Therefore, when God calls us a royal priesthood, it is not that we are actually instituting a priesthood. Are you following? God is simply saying that the same way that a priest was supposed to do something very important, the purpose of a priest was to give gifts and sacrifices. You read that in Hebrews 5. He was supposed to give gifts and sacrifices. So it is that the reason why God can refer to us as a priesthood is because when we reach people in the world that know not God, we are presenting the gift of salvation, Christ to the individuals. We are making them aware of the great sacrifice on the cross that was done on their behalf. It is only in that context are we a quote unquote priesthood. Are you following? So therefore, we're not talking about a literal establishment of a priesthood. But I believe this, because God did look at us 
as a royal priesthood, I think there are some very powerful lessons we can learn from the priesthood. And I want you to see something the Bible says, and we're going to go to the book of Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And I find this to be very powerful because I think there's some things we're going to see that we can learn some lessons from considering we are a royal priesthood. We are the ones whom God has chosen to bring the message of salvation, to present the gift of salvation, to tell them about the sacrifice of Christ to the world that they may accept him. Now, notice what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 4. In Exodus 4, notice what it says in verse 14. If you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says in Exodus 4, 14, talking about Aaron, it says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? He says, I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. Now, Aaron was referred to as a what? What did they refer to him as? A Levite. Very good. Now go to Exodus 28. Aaron was referred to as a Levite. Now, in Exodus 28, we want to learn something about these Levites. The Bible says in Exodus 28, we're going to look at verses 1 and 3. In Exodus 28, verses 1 and 3, the Bible says, And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may do what? Minister unto me in the priest's office. Very interesting. It says, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. Verse 3, and thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So here it is that Aaron was referred to as a Levite. Then we see that Aaron the Levite also would function in the office of a priest. And when he functioned in the office of a priest, he was ministering unto God and he also ministered unto the people. Are you following so far? All right. Pretty simple. Now, go to the book of Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. Let's see something else that the Bible brings out to our attention. Numbers the 16th chapter. And we're going to look at verse 5, and then we're going to look at number 17, verses 5 to 10. Number 16, 5, and then you want to put your finger on number 17, verses 5 to 10. Notice what the Bible says in number 16, verse 5. Are we there? It says in verse 5, And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is what? Holy. Now, there was a contention, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And the contention was based on who is the one that was actually called of God to function in a certain capacity. Therefore, God saw it necessary now in verse 5 to go ahead and respond to this argument that was being presented. And he says, And he spake unto Korah and unto all this company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him, whom he hath chosen, will he cause to come near unto him. Amen. Now, go to chapter 17, and let's look at verses 5 to 10. Number 17, verses 5 to 10. Who is this one that ultimately God was to present and to make known to the people that he is holy? Notice what the Bible says in number 17, and we're looking at verses 5 to 10. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose, shall blossom. And I will make to cease from the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So God says, the one that I'm going to show you is holy is whoever's rod it is that begins to bud. Now watch, verse 6. And Moses spake unto the children of Israel, and every one of their princes gave him a rod, a piece. For each prince one, according to their father's houses, and even twelve rods. And the rod of Aaron was among their rods. And Moses laid up the rods before the Lord in the tabernacle of witness. And it came to pass that on the morrow, Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of who? Aaron, for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed 
uh, blossoms and yielded almonds. And Moses brought out all the rods from before the Lord unto the, all the children of Israel. And they looked and took every man his rod. And the Lord said unto Moses, bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the rebels. And thou shalt quite take away their murmurings from me that they die not. So here it is that thus far we learned a few things. In Exodus 4, we learn that Aaron was also referred to as a Levite. Then later on, we went to Exodus 28, and we saw that the Levites also function in the priest's office. Then we also now find in Numbers 16.5 and Numbers 17.5 through 10, that Aaron the Levite, or those who are Levites, were also declared to be holy people. Are you following? Hold on to these points. Now, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, let's notice something that I think is very, very interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, notice what the Bible says in verse 8. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 8, it says, At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister unto him, and to bless his name unto this day. So the function of Levi was to minister unto God and to bless his name. Is that right? Now, here's what I found to be very interesting. We take all of this package that we put together so far. Aaron, Levi. Levite functions in the priest's office. Priests were those who ministered to God, ministered to God's people. These same priests were those who God also called to be holy people. Is that right? I wonder, did the priests have anything to do with Israel and music? Let's go to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 9. First Chronicles chapter 9. Because God has referred to his people in these last days as a royal priesthood. In First Chronicles chapter 9, let's notice something the Bible says in verse 33. In First Chronicles chapter 9 and verse 33, this is what the Bible says. It says, and these are the singers chief of the fathers of the Levites, who remaining in the chambers were free, for they were employed in that work day and night. Levites, who functioned in the priest's office, who were holy people, and the Bible even says they wore holy garments. The Bible said that they even wore holy garments. The Bible said that they even wore holy garments. Everything that the priest was to represent in how they dressed as well as how they sang, it was to testify to holiness. You are a royal priesthood. Even your garments are to testify to holiness. And they were singers. And they were in charge of the singing. Do you know that it was the priests that were to lead the rest of Israel on how they should sing and lift up the notes to God? They were the leaders. Now, the reason why that, I thought that was very powerful is because when we talk about how to utilize music, I thought about this. When I think about Israel, it says this in Desire of Ages 448. It says, with sacred song, it says, and thanksgiving, the worshipers celebrated this occasion. It says, a little before the feast was the Day of Atonement. So this is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles because before the Feast of Tabernacles was the Day of Atonement. All right? It says, be a little before the feast was the day of atonement when after confession of their sins, the people were declared to be at peace with heaven. So if ever there was a time to rejoice, it was then. Because the Feast of Tabernacles was the feast that followed the day of atonement. Our Feast of Tabernacles will not be celebrated on this earth. 
When the day of atonement is over and Christ is able to say, let him who is filthy be filthy still. Let him who is holy be holy still. When Jesus comes for his holy righteous people, it is as he gathers them and everyone is on their way up, they're going to be enjoying the Feast of Tabernacles. And we will be singing, but it will be sacred song. It says that with sacred song and thanksgiving, the worshipers celebrated this occasion. A little before the feast was the day of atonement. When after confession of their sins, the people were declared to be at peace with heaven. It says, thus the way was prepared for the rejoicing of the feast. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. Psalm 106, one rose triumphantly. It says, while all kinds of music mingled with shouts of Hosanna accompanied the united singing. The temple was the center of the universal joy. Here was the pomp of the sacrificial ceremonies. It says here ranged on either side of the white marble steps of the sacred building, the choir of Levites led the service of song. It says the multitude of worshipers waving their branches of palm and myrtle took up the strain and echoed the chorus. And again, the melody was caught up by voices near and afar off till the encircling hills were vocal with praise. And so we see that inspiration helps us to understand that a great role of the Levites was that they were, they functioned in the priest's office and in that function of the priest's office, they were in charge of music. That was part of what they did. They were in charge of the music. They were the ones to make sure that the music would fit and work right. They would make sure that music would do what it's supposed to do, which was to serve a holy purpose. Because everything about the priest, everything about Israel was supposed to be holiness. Go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, notice what the Bible says. In 1 Peter chapter 1, God's desire always has been and always will be. And this is why I said in the present tense, but it's also said in the past tense. Because it was always God's desire in 1 Peter chapter 1 in verses 15 and 16. If you're there, please say amen. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, But as he which hath called you is what? Holy. It says, so be ye what? Holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So the great purpose and the great focus of God is that we are to be holy, but remember, It said, in all manner of conversation. Now, if we read that, we'll just say, okay, that's just talking about how I speak. But brothers and sisters, when you look up the word conversation, it's talking about lifestyle. When you look it up in the Greek, it's actually talking about lifestyle. In every dynamic of human lifestyle, God says, I expect you to be holy. Whether you're hanging out with your friends by yourself or whether you're standing before the masses, whether you are sitting down doing a Bible study or whether you're sitting down watching a televised program, whatever it is that you and I to do, holiness was designed to be the focus and nothing else. And the reason why, brothers and sisters, it's more applicable today than ever is because we are living in the anti-typical day of atonement. Final decisions are being made. At the cross, Christ began the work of of the plan of salvation, but he's going to complete it in the most holy place. You read that in Great Controversy, page 489, and you can see that throughout the sanctuary. Even when you look at the cross, I remember some people always believe, oh, it all ended at the cross. Brothers and sisters, anybody who says that is not studying their Bibles, right? The Bible says that the way sin is forgiven is that the atonement is made. Is that right? I see the blood spilled in the outer court or at the cross, but I don't see how that blood was carried to make an atonement at the cross. You ever thought about that? So many people believe, oh, the atonement, everything was done at the cross. But even when you study the sanctuary, it says that when they would go and you read it in Leviticus chapter 4. You read it right there in Leviticus 4. Leviticus 4 verses 27 to 31. It says that after they would slay the animal, it says the next thing that would happen is they would take the blood. And they would have to go somewhere and it says that they may make an atonement for it. That didn't happen at the cross. The blood was spilt, but it had to be taken. And then it had to be presented so that it would be found acceptable so that the people can truly be forgiven. So therefore, there had to be another step in the plan of salvation. And that's why at the cross, the plan of salvation began, but it's going to be completed in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, 
Understanding this, because the next session that we're going to do is going to be music in the most holy place. We need to understand then that here it is that thus far we're seeing that, okay, there is a royal priesthood that God has today, you and I. We are to represent Christ to the world. And in our representation of Christ, the Bible says, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, every dynamic of your lifestyle. And that means even in my singing, it is to promote what? Holiness. That's going to be very, very key. Now, if we were to ask the question, what is holiness anyhow? What would your answer be? Somebody asked, well, what is holiness? What, what is holy or holiness? What, what, is that, what, is that, what is that all about? What does that have to do with anything? What, what would you, how would you define it? Because you've got to define it. It's one thing for God to say, you know, everything I want you to do is holy. But it's another thing to say, okay, well, how do I do that? You know what I'm saying? So therefore, question, what is holiness? Or how do you define holiness? How would you explain that to someone? Just so they can understand. Something that is separated for God's purpose. Okay, good. Any other thing? Being in, the presence of God. Being in the presence of God. Nice. Yes. Being sanctified day by day. Now I'm going to ask you, what does it mean to be sanctified? You know what I'm saying? It's like that's what's naturally what's going to come out if I'm the inquiring mind. If I'm trying to understand it so that you can make it practical for me, then I need you to do that. Remember, a gospel that is not practical is a worthless gospel. So you don't want to give theological terms necessarily and leave it there. It's okay to give a theological term as long as you can break it down. And make it practical. You know what I'm saying? You should be able to explain holiness to a point that a child can walk away and say, I got that. Can I help you? We just read it. God said, be ye holy as I am holy. You want to know what holiness is? To be like God. Holiness is to be like God. Whatever you read about in the Bible that tells us about God and his character. You know, when you go to Exodus 34, you remember Exodus 33, when Moses came to God and he said, Lord, show me thy glory. Exodus 33, 18, he said, show me thy glory. Verse 19, God says, no problem. I'll show you my goodness and I'll proclaim my name. That's like me saying, hey, Edward, show me your car. He says, no problem. I'll show you my Cadillac. We're talking about the same thing. I said car, you said Cadillac, but we're talking about the same thing. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I'll show you my goodness and proclaim my name. Using different terms, talking about the same thing. In Exodus 34, did God show it to him? What did he show him? He said, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, and so on. He's revealed his character. He revealed his character. He said, you want to know who I am? Look at my character. I'm merciful. I'm gracious. I'm long-suffering. And the list goes on and on and on. I'm holy. So therefore, when we talk about being holy, to be holy is to be like God, just to make it simple. So whatever I'm singing, it must encourage people to become more like God. Are you following? No music, no singing should enter in your ears if it does not motivate you to be more like God. To reflect his character. You can start using this as check marks. You know, how do I know good music from bad music? How do I know this, that, and the other? Because in, in, in music in the most holy place, the next session, we'll get a little bit more into music. But right now, I want to deal with lyrics. I want to deal with the kind of words that we allow to enter into our heads through headphones. You see, God wanted to make it clear as priests... He says, I've called you to be holy in everything that you do, from your garment to your singing. Everything. What is holiness? Holiness is to be like God, to reflect his character. So when I listen to a song, and if I'm listening to a man by the name of Jay-Z, Beyonce, or whatever their name may be, the first thing I can do is say, is this going to help me reflect more of the image of Jesus? Do you know it ought to be that simple enough that we would throw it away? It ought to be that simple that we would say, I need to toss this stuff. Because I'm going to tell you right now, there's only one reason why, there's only one reason why you can meet a lot of, especially young black men, but I I see this amongst white, red, yellow, and green nowadays too, but uh, you know, I especially see it amongst black men. You know, when I used to watch Brothers Walk, and I would see them do this thing where they just kind of... And I'm thinking to myself, 
Did you come out of your mother's womb walking like that? <laughs> when I hear a young man and, 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 and he's talking to people older than him, but he's calling him son. Yo, son, let me tell you what happened, son. It's like, that's not your child. Where'd you learn that? When people begin to talk to each other and, 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 and they start to say things like, what's up? What's up, kid? How you doing, kid? First of all, I'm not a baby goat. <laughs> where all this SH, what's up, shum, ship, ship, ship. Where, where did all that come from? You want to know where all that stuff came from? You want to know where it all came from? It came by, by what they were beholding. They watched the rap video, they became a rap video. When you see a young lady today and she's coloring her hair like the rainbow, when you see her and she's wearing garments that, that make her look like a prostitute in training. Brothers and sisters, when you see our dear sisters that are walking around representing themselves like this, where, did they come out their mother's womb like that? No. They learned that by what they were beholding. You see, the Bible teaches a principle in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that says that by beholding from glory to glory, we are changed. Ellen White modernized the term by simply saying, by beholding, we become changed. So when I see my dear sisters with their faces painted up, lipstick, hair, all different colors, this, that, and the other, all that tells me is you've been beholding some things. You didn't come out your parents' womb like that. You're beholding some things. When I see young men who have their pants hanging off their backside and all that stuff, they don't even know the stories behind it. Brothers who were depressed in prison, and here it is that many of them would take the belts off of their straps and they would wrap it around their necks and hang themselves and kill themselves. So what did the prisoners, what did the prison system start to do? They said, you know what? Take the belts away from them. So guess what? Brothers started walking around with pants hanging off their backside. Had no choice because they were not allowed to use belts to hold their pants up. The problem is because the prison system today is only a prison system of holding and not reformation, what happened was the brothers came out still dressing like that and all it took was one rapper to get locked up. And then when he came out and his pants was hanging off his backside and then he ended up doing a music video and he's doing this and doing that and everybody's just watching, all of a sudden they said, man, that's cool. Let me let my pants hang off my backside. And now you got thousands. Red, black, yellow, and green. Every color under the sun. And now they got their pants hanging off their backside. Looking like a bunch of convicts. If we understood that in all manner of conversation, in everything that we are called to do, brothers and sisters, God said that you were supposed to even sing. And it was only supposed to promote one thing. Holiness holiness, to be like God, to reflect his character. And sometimes people say, well, Brother Lemon, wait a minute. Are you saying that, that, that I can't sing songs about history and, and all these other things, things that may not necessarily tell about holiness? You know what I say to that, brothers and sisters? How many of you ever heard of the Salvation Army? You heard of the Salvation Army? Now, when you think of the Salvation Army, are they doing a good work? I don't have any problem with their work. They're trying to help people. Do you know that inspiration says that we are not to do the work of the Salvation Army? Ellen White says we are not to do the work of the Salvation Army. You ever heard of a man by the name of George Mueller? How many of you ever heard of George Mueller? Did he do a good work? Oh, yes. Helping all those wonderful orphans? We would be crazy to say that that's a bad work. He helped a lot of people, didn't he? You know, Ellen White says that George Mueller's work is not our work. That's not our work. What's our work? Our work is to prepare a people to stand true in the judgment hour. That's our work. And nothing is to cause us disfocus from that. So in other words, the point I'm making is this. While there are many good things and great things that can be done by people, let them do it. Our mission is a very focused mission. And our mission is to give that third angel's message to the world to tell the people how to stand true to God in the time of judgment. That's our work. Now I understand, because I didn't understand this quote before. How many of you have ever read Early Writings, page 63, where Ellen White says, There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but what the flock needs now is present truth. 
So she did not deny, oh, there's many precious truths contained in the word of God. But what the people need right now is present truth. Next paragraph under, third paragraph on that very same page, she explains what present truth is. The sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And she begins to go on through that list. That's our work, brothers and sisters. So while you may say, oh, I want to sing some songs about documentaries, or I want to sing some songs about certain points of history and this, that, and the other, leave that work for somebody else. We have a specific work to do. Every song, every poem that is put together should be put under the acid test. Does this song help produce holiness in the people? Does it help them become more like God? Does it help them reflect the image of God? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that if you have anything written by uh, Jay-Z, Beyonce, or any of these hip-hop or R&B artists, that today, if you're hearing God's voice, you should burn it tonight. I'm serious. Get right there on Southern University campus and take it all and just drop it in the fire. Say, that's it. I'm done with this stuff. That's if you hear the voice of Jesus. I told you in that class over there. I said, this is a class only for people who want the truth. If you came here to hear some la-di-da, wrong class. We are here because we're trying to understand that there's a great revival and reformation that must take place amongst the people of God. We need this experience. It's the greatest of our works and the most urgent of our needs. So as a result of that, we have to do what God says. Now, I want you to look at this. Go to the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. In 1 Chronicles 15... I want you to see something that I thought was very interesting. In 1 Chronicles 15, you'll see in verse 16 that God once again establishes the fact that the Levites were the ones that were in charge, even with the brethren. Now, I want you to look at this. It says, and David spake, 1 Chronicles 15, 16, and David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So therefore, the Levites were the ones that were appointed even to be in charge, not just of the lyrics, but even the music. Is that right? Now, today, let's say we were to equate that type of individual to the choir leader. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that before we would ever bring a choir leader into our churches to lead the people in song, they must first bear witness and bear testimony that they are living a consecrated life? And you know what's so sad? If you go to most churches today, you can see sometimes before even talking to them that the life has not been surrendered to Christ yet. Might be ignorance, might be rebellion, but in either case, not surrendered yet. And I understand our churches sometimes, we try to employ people because we think that giving people offices in the church will keep them in the church. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a dangerous position. That's a real dangerous position. Because when somebody's put office in the church, that means they're a leader. So one of the first things you want to do is make sure that you establish your leaders and make sure they're leaders and not followers. So if you give somebody position in the church and you can clearly see that they are following after the pattern of the world, that's the wrong person to put in leadership. You're going to have to train them, instruct them. You can hold them by their side. They can be a choir leader in training while the person who is consecrated is to go before the people. But brothers and sisters, we are to understand that number one, if an individual is going to lead out in song, they must bear witness to the consecrated life. Do you know how many choir leaders would be fired based on that? I'm serious. Do you, know, do you, do you remember that the Levites were supposed to bear the Ark of the Covenant? That means that Levites were also commandment keepers. So why in the world do Seventh-day Adventist churches have music leaders who are not even part of the remnant? Can they understand holiness? Chances are they're not going to even understand it. Are you following? I'm serious. These are some challenges. So if we were to really start ascertaining and looking at it and say, man, the Levites were the ones who were in charge of music. When we look at the Levites, they were holy people. They were representing holiness. They were in charge of the music. They were in charge of the lyrics. They were the ones who was to make sure that in everything that they do. I'm so glad that when we read Desire of Ages 448, it says that they led out in sacred song, not worldly music. 
These were individuals who understood God, had a connection with God, and was able to lead the people to God. So if we were to begin just simply looking at some of the activities that are taking place today, if you yourself in this room right now may be a choir leader, but you know your life is not surrendered. Brothers and sisters, that means that, you know what? I'm going to have to reevaluate some of the decisions that I've made. I'm going to have to start looking deeper and perhaps I may even have to, for the sake of integrity and godly courtesy, I may have to even step down because currently I am not qualified to do this. It's a great position of humility, brothers and sisters. But we must understand that the Levites were the ones who were in charge of the music. They were in charge of the lyrics and they were the ones, brothers and sisters, whom God appointed to lead Israel. And brothers and sisters, if you know, I'm serious, if you know that you are a choir leader or a choir member, or you know that you're part of some song group or whatever the case may be, but you know in the deep recesses of your own heart, when you're in your car, when you're in your room and on your MP3 player, you got Jay-Z, Beyonce, and you got Indy Irie and Jill Scott, and you got all of these different hip hop, r and be neo soul rock and roll pop artists on your stuff God is saying today you need to yield that you need to yield that you need to give that to me you need to surrender that because God says there's no way that holiness will be produced in any mind or any heart if you're listening to that kind of stuff if you want holiness you see some people don't want holiness those are the representatives of cold God can deal with them because they're cold they're straight up they're saying, look, I don't want holiness. I don't want to live for God. I don't want to do any of this stuff. I just want to do what I want to do. God says, as terrible as that is, I can still reach you because you're deceived. And I need to open your eyes and help you behold wondrous things out of my law. But when we hold that fence and say, no, 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 I, I, I could listen to Beyonce. And even though I listen to her, I can still pull out some good out of her songs. That's like being lukewarm. It makes God want to vomit. You're trying to hold on to the world and make excuses for holding on to it. God says, no, 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 no. If you're going to go there, God says, you're going to make it very difficult for me to help you. Don't try to sanctify sin. And that's what's happening a lot today amongst many people. So therefore, the choir leaders, those who are in leadership, those are the ones who are to make sure that in all that they say and do, that the representation of their lives and their lifestyles is that of holiness before they even begin singing. But now let's go to lyrics. Ephesians 5. In Ephesians 5, does God give us instruction even on lyrics? Yes, he does. Ephesians chapter 5, notice what the Bible says. When you get there, say Amen. In Ephesians 5, the Bible says in verse 19, Ephesians 5 and verse 19, it says, oh, rather, let's look at verse 18 and 19. It says, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So something happens when an individual is filled with the Spirit of God. One of the things that will happen is verse 19. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when we talk about certain types of lyrics that are used, we're looking at three instructions that God gives. He says psalms, he says spiritual songs, and then he also advocates what? Hymns. So these are things that God himself says, this is approved type music or singing. Now I want to connect that with Colossians chapter 3, because I thought Colossians 3 was brought out an element that, that was very powerful that wasn't necessarily brought out in Ephesians 5. In Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says something in verses 16 and 17 that we would do well to consider. Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. But notice what it says in verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So God, again, he gives government. He says, all right, if you're going to go ahead and produce different types of songs, 
He says, number one, he says, there are three types of categories that I'm going to give you. Your psalms, your hymns, and your spiritual songs. Now, one of the applications that we can use for psalms is we can even talk about scripture songs. I'm going to use that as an example. Do we have the book of psalms? Yes, we do. Now, psalms ultimately was poetry. But the book of psalms was David's poetry, which was introduced in the canon and now presented to us as scripture. So therefore, it is appropriate to call Psalms scripture songs. Now, you'll find that, brothers and sisters, if you want to start memorizing the Word of God. Now, why do you think it's important to memorize the Word of God? Psalm 119.11. Thy word have I hid in my mind, heart, that I might not sin against thee. So therefore, is there a benefit of hiding the Word of God in our minds? Yes, there is. So should we memorize the scripture? Yes, we can. Do you know one of the best ways that the children of Israel taught their children was through scripture song? If you and I begin to embrace scripture songs, taking scripture and providing melody to it, brothers and sisters, it's one of the most incredible ways. And I remember I was teaching, you know, you, you've probably seen me with my four children. I tried so hard years ago to try to get them to memorize the Ten Commandments. And I'll just be like, okay, do it this way. And then they try. And then by the time they get up to commandment number five or six, they, don't, they just mess it up. And they just start, you, oh, commandment number eight is commandment number six, commandment number ten is commandment number two. I mean, they're just messing it up, right? Now, what happened was, a friend of mine came along, they said, Brother Lemon, why don't you sing the Ten Commandments? I said, sing the Ten I don't even know how to sing the Ten Commandments. So then she started walking me through this Ten Commandments song. And as she started to walk us through this Ten Commandments song, my wife and I was like, all right, we need to get this thing. So we're, we're learning it. We recorded it. And then we said, all right, let's practice it. So therefore, every Friday evening for family worship, we would get the kids together and we'd go ahead and start doing our scripture songs. And brothers and sisters, do you know our children were able to go from Exodus 21 through 17? And they were able to go verbatim, word for word. How? Because they learned the commandments of God now through song. And this is when they were as young as probably about three, my children are stair step, so they were as young as about three, four, five, six. And they were learning these things now. So I was like, man, praise God, this is phenomenal. So one of the things that God says is he says, number one, we can learn scripture songs. Number two, we definitely can go ahead and sing the wonderful hymns because the hymns come out of an experience. But then the Bible also says that we can do spiritual songs. Now, spiritual songs are not necessarily hymns. This is where we can now have, quote unquote, modern songs or songs today, but they will be governed by very important principles. Number one, we understand that melody is always to lead. Harmony is to be second. Rhythm is to be last. So therefore, we're going to now, when we formulate our spiritual songs, we're going to go ahead and make sure that the melody is the lead. We're going to have to start looking at, should I use the drum set? Yay, trap set. Next seminar, we're going to talk about it. We're going to start looking at all those different things to find out what constitutes a good spiritual song versus what does not. But the thing that I like is in Colossians 3, 17, it says doing it all in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? What does it mean to do it in the name of Jesus? Huh? Let's notice. It says, but to pray in Christ's name means much. It means that we are to accept his character manifest his spirit and work his works. Do you know that every song that is put together, and I'm talking about the lyrics, should be able to cause this to take place? Desire of Ages 668 says that when we do, when we pray in Christ's name, now if we're going to do anything in word or deed, Colossians says it should be in Christ's name. So this principle applies. It says it means that we are to accept his character manifest his spirit and work his works. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that even the songs that we listen to should motivate us to do evangelism? How many songs do you and I listen to that do that? Do you know that songs that we listen to should motivate us to want to study our Bibles more? Not less. Most people who listen to music, it becomes a replacement for Bible study. But when lyrics are put together right, do you know that it's actually supposed to cause us to even work the works of Christ? Did Christ have Bible study? Yes. Did Jesus spend often times in prayer? Yes. Did Jesus spend time helping the others who were in need? Yes. Do you know that every song that we do and every lyric or every type of thing that we write, it should promote these type of works within us? It should cause us to have the very same spirit of Christ, a spirit of compassion, love, not irritability. Not anger, not bitterness, nor resentment. It should cause us to manifest that same spirit that Christ had, meek, lowly, 
lovely, patient, long-suffering, gentle. Music was supposed to do that. It says, the Savior's promise is given on condition. If you love me, he says, keep my commandments. He saves men not in sin, but from sin. And those who love him will show their love by obedience. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that the songs that we listen to should cause us to have a hatred of sin and a love for obedience? I'm serious. If you and I were to take these principles and put our music to the test, do you know how much stuff we would have to say? This doesn't cut it. And we say, oh, but wait a minute, it has Christian lyrics in it. Brothers and sisters, listen, even Jesus said, look, many are going to say, Lord, Lord. <laughs> many people are going to say, oh, I did this and I did that in your name. Christ is going to say, depart from me. And, you know, I wish he said, I don't know you, because even, even that's not bad. But he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. The saddest words that can never come from the lips of Jesus. So people can do stuff even with Christ's name in it. And it can still be offensive to God. I want to bring out a final point before we close on this. I want you to see something that I, I just thought was so incredible. Look at this quotation. As a part of religious service, singing is as much an act of worship as is prayer. This is Messages to Young People 292. It says, indeed, many a song is prayer. Do you believe that? Think about a lot of the songs that we sing. Are we not asking God for something in those songs? And that's what prayer is. Prayer is communication with God. We're asking. We're making our requests known unto him, right? Now watch this. So that many a song is prayer. It says, if the child is taught to realize this, he will think more of the meaning of the words he sings and will be more susceptible to their power. Now, the reason why I found this to be very powerful, if many a song is prayer, I want us to look at some ways that God even taught us how to govern our prayer life. Go to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Many a song is prayer. You will find often that when David prayed, many of them were songs, poems, psalms. In Matthew chapter 6, it's interesting what God says about prayer. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, because many a song is prayer. So the rules that are to govern prayer can also govern the kind of songs we listen to. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You ever listen to songs where it seems like they're just saying the same thing over and over and over again all throughout the song? I remember one time I was doing an evangelistic meeting, and as we were doing the evangelistic meeting, the song leader got in there, and, and, and uh, I was one of the Bible workers. I wasn't the speaker. I was one of the Bible workers, but the evangelist, when he saw that people were responding to the person's song, he would tell the singer, sing it again, sing it again. He just keeps singing it over and over and over again. And the singer just kept repeating the same words, repeating the same words, and the people were just like, oh, 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 and they were getting real emotional. <laughs> they were getting real emotional. So what he did is he was playing on the emotion. You know, the majority of those people are not even in the church today. They join because of emotionalism. And a lot of times in different songs and choir leaders and all, and all these different types of songs that we do, you find a lot of this vain repetition. It's the same lyrics over and over and over again. People can make a whole song last five minutes and it only consists of maybe 10 words. That's it. And it's just after that over and over and over again. Christ said, don't pray in vain repetition as the heathen does, because they think that they will be heard by their much speech. Many a times people think that the more that they repeat certain statements over and over and over again in a song, it is as if they're gaining more and more of God's attention. No, brothers and sisters. That's why I love that principle. When I learned that many a prayer is a song, many a song is a prayer rather, I said, wow, that means that all the rules Christ gave about prayer can also be rules that can govern singing. So therefore, when I put together or formulate songs, my goal is not to just keep saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. I am not to try to put together lyrics in such a way that I am imitating what the heathen does in the world. And that's why it hurts me so bad. You know, my mother's from the West Indies. 
And, you know, in the West Indies, they have this thing where if the men were thinking that they're shooting a gun off or when they shoot a gun, they would use a term like buyaka. That, that was a term that they were using. That was their way of trying to imitate the sound of a gun going off. But you know what hurt me so bad? Is when a man by the name of Kirk Franklin in one of his videos literally put his hands up in the air in the name of Jesus and said, buyaka, buyaka. And he just started doing the same thing and just shooting his hand up in the air like that. And I said, isn't that something? I said, that's how perverted the gospel work can get when we allow ourselves to look at what the heathen is doing and then to try to imitate it. And that's why today you got a whole lot of heathen worship taking place in God's church. You got hip hop gospel, reggae gospel, R&B gospel, soca gospel, and all of these different forms of gospel music. And brothers and sisters, we don't even understand it, but ne in the next session you will. We're going to find out exactly where gospel music came from. And brothers and sisters, what I'm telling you is that many of us have violated the very principles that God said we are looking to the heathens and we are letting them teach us how to conduct worship when we were the priests that were supposed to be the leaders. Let's close on these final two points here. Go to the Psalm 66. What else can we learn about prayer? Psalm 66. Psalm 66 and verse 18. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, another rule that God has given as it relates to prayer. What does God say in Psalm 66 and verse 18? He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, says the Lord won't even hear me. Do you know it's possible that we can write out some of the best songs? And while we preach to others, we ourselves can become castaways. You see, when we get out of this idea that singing in church is a performance... God wants to wake us up from that deception because when we typically go to, 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 to present and, and to sing, we must understand that it's worship. It's not performing. And the reason why I know that many of us get this confused is because nine times out of ten when somebody sings in a church, what do we do at the end of it? You only do that for performances, not for worship. If we were to understand that when that person comes forward and they begin to sing, they are expressing their love and devotion to Jesus Christ. And they are worshiping God. When the congregation hears it, the congregation is to join in with that person singing so that now the person and the congregation are worshiping God together. When we understand that right, then when the singer is finished and when the congregation is finished, then the only appropriate thing to say at the end of a worship experience is amen. amen. If we could get out of the mindset of thinking that I am performing. In fact, this leads me to the final point, John 17. I love this. I mean, once I built on that principle, man, when I said, man, everything is a prayer. Our songs are prayers. Then that means that the rules that govern prayer govern songs too. Then I look at John 17. John 17 and verse 9. Look at what the Bible says in verse 9. In John 17, verse 9, the Bible says, I pray for them. I pray for who? Yeah. For them. It says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Do you know that Jesus spent more time in prayer praying for others and their benefit than for himself? You know why that's important to me? When we sing, it's about blessing others and not exalting my skill or my talent in singing. When I sing, it is not about me. You listen to most people who sing, they're trying to do all the riffs, the high setters and the false setters, and they're trying to make all these different sounds with their voices and go up and down and sound like Whitney Houston or sound like this latest artist or that latest artist. And we want to sound and make ourselves fit in some type of category and make sure that everybody can just say, whoo, that person can sing. We want the glory to ourselves. But brothers and sisters, that's not how we should pray. When we pray, the glory is removed from self. When we pray, we are humbling ourselves. That's why we even kneel. Everything about prayer is about humbling oneself before God. And brothers and sisters, when we sing, we are humbling ourselves before God as we're worshiping him and lifting up Christ and not ourselves. It is an atrocity when Seventh-day Adventists can go to competitions and sing songs about Jesus when they're trying to beat other singers. There's no way you can do that 
if you understood that every song is a prayer. And the rules that God gave to govern prayer, he gave to govern singing. Brothers and sisters, Satan constantly wants to try to get us to exalt self and sin rather than exalt Christ. And Jesus says, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so, brothers and sisters, we find that God is trying to make it plain to yours and my heart that he's saying, listen, I am calling you to understand that when you utilize music, when you're getting involved in singing, he says, remember the Levite. Remember that they were holy people. You need to be holy. Remember that everything about the Levite, everything about the priest was holiness. Therefore, everything about you should be holiness. Remember that if you're leading people, remember the great, the, the purpose of the song that is put together is to help the people reflect the image of Jesus. You got to look at that. And the reason why I say this is because by their fruit, you shall know them. When I see people who could listen to all sorts of gospel music, but they still dress like the world, act like the world, eat like the world, drink like the world and do everything else like the world. That tells me that that music has no power. Because God's music was designed to bring revival and reformation. Even music was designed to bring it. You know, we're told that we can't have revival and reformation without first getting back into a deep spirit of prayer. But every song is a prayer. So that if we're going to experience true revival and reformation, brothers and sisters, that means we need to once again look at this issue of music and we have to find out if we're bringing God's fire or strange fire into the sanctuary. We're going to have to start looking at it. Am I taking the things of the world and just combining Christian lyrics to it? If, if that's all I'm doing, I'm no different than Nadab and Abihu. Who had fire come out of the cistern and burned them up right there in the sanctuary. So therefore, brothers and sisters, if you are determined in your heart to say, listen, and I'm serious, I'm, I'm, I'm making an appeal on this. If you have been listening to worldly artists... I don't care who they are. I'm using names that I'm familiar with, but I know that there's so many out there and I certainly can't keep up with it. Because that's, that's a part of my past now. Thank the Lord. I'm serious. I've been there, done that. I'm telling you. It's like, I, I, you got to understand. I used to eat, sleep, and drink hip-hop, R&B, and, and all this stuff. I mean, neo-soul. I used to eat, sleep, and drink that stuff. I thought I couldn't live without it. But that's because I only understood life without Christ. But I'm telling you, when Jesus comes in your heart, he can give you a satisfaction that will even surprise you. You'll be like, I actually like this song. I mean, you actually, I mean, I listen to certain hymns and certain scripture songs today, and I'm literally driving in my car like, this is all right. <laughs> let, me, let me rewind that. Let me play that again. <laughs> and there are times I'm, I'm just in my car, I'm just like, Lord, you have got to be real. Because I mean, I would never have listened to this stuff. And you know, and I, I, I know that. But it's just to show, man, God can do anything. And to me, that's deeper than seeing the economy fall in 2008, which I do believe was prophetic. But the, the, the greater proof for me of seeing Christ being real is when I, when I look and say, the things I once loved, I actually hate. The things I once hated, I actually love. I actually love it. I'm not faking it like, oh, I'm enjoying this music. And, and you know, in my heart, in my mind, I'm like, man, I hate this stuff. You know, and it's just punishment. I'm like, turn it up louder. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm enjoying it. I'm actually enjoying it. This Christian lifestyle, I'm actually enjoying this thing. That is just the deepest thing to me. And so I make an appeal, and I'm serious, I'm talking to your heart, you know. I have no heaven or hell to put you in, I hope you know that. So therefore, this is not something that you're going to respond to for me, because I don't have anything to offer you, except the one who did something for me. But what I'm telling you is, is that I do understand the bondage of the world. I do understand the bondage of, of the entertainment industry. I do understand the bondage of worldly, secular music. Those things I do understand. So therefore, I'm making this appeal to you and I'm talking real to you, okay? I'm serious, I'm talking real to you. If you know that on your MP3 player or in your CD stack or collection or somewhere on your laptop computer or somewhere, if you know you got artists of the world on there, you know that you got that stuff there. And you can understand better today to say, you know what? I know that that stuff is not going to do anything else but help me reflect the ugly image of Satan and not the lovely image of Jesus. If you know that you're listening to that type of stuff and you're saying, you know what? I don't feel it. 
but I'm going to choose to go ahead and let it go anyhow. Now, I'm going to say this to you as we close. Pastor Bradshaw's message was very powerful today. And there's one little piece that I'd like to add. He talked about the letting go of things and the choosing and the yielding and all these things. But I want to give you just one little addition to that state, to those points that he made. It's a quote from the book, Early Writings, page 72. You want to know Early Writings, page 72? It's under a chapter called Prayer and Faith. You want to know what it says? It says, faith is ours to exercise. But joyful feeling and the blessing is God's to give. Is that sweet or what? Because what is it that hinders us nine times out of ten from choosing to do what's right? We say, I don't feel like it. Is that right? God says, I understand. God says, right under my sleeve, I have some joyful feeling. And all I want you to do is exercise faith and choose and do what I say. And then once you and I choose to do what God says, and we say, you know what, that music, you know what, I spent a lot of money on that. You know what, I like listening to that. But you know what, God spoke to my heart. He made it plain to me. All right, Lord, I'm going to exercise faith. I'm going to do it. God says, good. I will download high speed from the most holy place, joyful feeling. I'll put joyful feeling in your heart. And all of a sudden, even you are surprised. And you say, you know what? I actually feel good about the decision I made for the Lord. God never asked you to develop joyful feeling. God said, just accept it. Because he says, because I'm the one who gives it. So therefore, don't think that when you exercise faith and you let stuff go, that you won't be at peace with it. At first, you're going to have to do it, and you may not feel nothing initially, but God promises, listen, faith is yours to exercise, but joyful feeling and the blessing is mine to give you. And God says, I will give it to you. And so if there be anyone in the sound of my voice that you know you're listening to things of the world, you're lo you know that whether it's on the MP3 player, on the recorders, on the computers, whatever it may be, the CD stacks, whatever you got, if you know I'm listening to stuff that I know I have no business listening to and God has opened my eyes today and by his grace and by his power. Today, even though I might not feel it right now, but today, I am going to yield, I'm going to choose to let it go. If that's your choice, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. You know who you are. You know who you are. Don't worry about who's looking at you. Nobody in this room has a heaven or hell to put you in. No one. You're saying today, I'm letting it go. I'm cutting it off. I'm going to get rid of it. And the reason why I make this point to say today is because in Psalm 119, brothers and sisters, in verse uh, 40, it tells us, I made haste to keep God's commandments. When God tells you to do something, you don't want to delay. If you delay and if you keep looking at it, and if you keep saying, well, you know what, tomorrow, then what's going to happen is you start to lose some of that effect. And that decision you're making right now that you're fired up about is going to start dying down. And before you know it, if you don't do it, then what's going to happen? Three to four days later, you're going to say, you know what? I think I'll, I'll hold on to this for a little while longer. And sometimes you end up in a worse condition than you were in beforehand. So you're being honest with yourselves. And as you're standing, I want you to know Christ stands with you. He's really going to help you through this process because his mission is to save you. He can't save you in sin. He can only save you from it. You got to be able to see and say, look, I know that I'm listening to stuff that I got no business listening to. I need to get rid of this. It's a distraction for me. And I want you to know that as Jesus is standing right next to you, he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. I will be your source of strength and I'll give you true victory. We're praying. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the precious souls, Lord God, that you have caused to stand this world, Lord God, we need many people to stand up for Jesus. Lord, I believe that there are others who should have stood. But Father, I know that your love and your mercy, you delight in mercy. I pray that you'll continue to press upon the hearts of those who should have stood and who did not. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to guide our minds and our thoughts and help us to understand these fundamental principles, Lord. Oh, I know we can go so much deeper. But Lord, I pray if we could at least get some of these points, Father, it's a good start. So I pray, bless my dear brothers and sisters. Help them to keep searching, to keep digging, to go deeper, dear God. 
And I pray that in the end, may hearts be fully and completely converted unto thee. We thank you so much for hearing this prayer, Lord. Thank you for bringing deliverance into this room today and making your people free. In Jesus' name, amen.